tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Forget Me Not Written by Kelsey Donald Performed by Olivia Steele It was another beautiful day. The sun shone brightly overhead as I lay on the cool, crisp grass, staring up at the blue sky. Blue flowers speckled the hill, swaying in the soft breeze. Nothing made me happier than sitting on the hill with Aaron, watching the clouds in the city below. That one looks like a flower, Aaron said, pointing up at the clouds. I see a heart and a seashell. I wondered what the clouds looked like on the day we first kissed, Aaron mused. A flicker. I frowned. I think it was raining that day. Aaron lazily rolled on his side and faced me. He smiled. No, Mal. It was beautiful. Heart clouds, dark clouds, swirling strings of clouds. He was rambling. I sat up and rubbed my forehead. Flashes. Sounds and pictures. You're right, I said. It wasn't raining then. It rained the last time we kissed. The day we broke up. Broke up? We never broke up. Aaron traced circles in the air with his fingers and sighed happily. The sun was blinding now. I squinted my eyes against the glare. It was getting painful, boring through my eyes into my skull. I collapsed on the hill. Memories flooding in like a bursting dam. This isn't right. We did break up, I insisted through gritted teeth. I remember now. You left me in the rain. I ran home. Mom had the news on. That was the day of the first sighting. Sighting of what? What am I missing? I raised a hand to shield my eyes from the sun. Dust billowed up around me and the soft cushion of grass now felt dry and gritty. It was the day... The day, a final snap, everything falls into place. The day they arrived. A blink and my vision cleared. Everything cleared as the fog lifted from the crevices in my mind. I kept my hand in front of my eyes as the sun glared down at me. No, it wasn't the sun. It was a searchlight overhead. The dust whipped into a frenzy as the craft circled above us. I froze. Who arrived, Maul? Aaron seemed unaware of the roaring aircraft above us. It was all I could do not to run screaming. I clamped my teeth down on my hand and tasted blood. Seconds seemed like hours. By unbelievable luck, the craft moved on, dipping behind the hill. I unclenched my jaw and rubbed my hand, gasping for breath. Aaron was rambling again. Blue sky, robin's egg blue, cornflower blue, cobalt, cadet, and sapphire. I got to my feet. We were on the hill behind the school, although it looked very different than I remembered. It had been our meeting place, back when we were dating, that is. Aaron and I were together for most of junior year, until the week before finals. We walked home in the rain, and by the time I reached my front door... We were no longer a couple. I can't say I didn't see it coming, but I was hurt nonetheless. I didn't have time to grieve, however, because that was the night of the first sighting. Ships appeared in the skies and the next stayed over. We thought it was a prank. Even the newscasters joked about the strange objects. They hovered for the next two days as experts flew in to try to identify the crafts. It soon became clear. These ships were not of this world. Then, the next thing we knew, videos of death and destruction were broadcast across the airwaves. Human-sized machines, at least they looked like machines, had deployed from the ships 
and attacked the cities below. It felt like a bad dream, nothing more. It's easy to ignore a problem when it's only visible on a screen. Plus, I, I had to study for finals. But then, smoke appeared in the distance. And soon after, the ships arrived overhead. Many fled the city. I thought my family would too, but when I ran home from school, scared and out of breath, I saw that my parents had evacuated without me. I hid in my room as I heard the sounds of artillery in the distance. The last thing I remembered was the loud splintering of wood as my door broke down, and the sharp tick, tick, tick of machinery as it approached my hiding place. Then, blurred images, too weak to be actual memories. I went to school, shopped at the mall, and spent time on the hill with Aaron. Happy memories. Fake memories. The sun was always shining, the neighbors always friendly. Aaron and I were still in love. Any thought of our breakup, our fights, was gone. Now, standing on the hill, I had a good view of the city. I barely recognized it. Buildings lay in ruins and trails of smoke rose in the distance. The nearest building was the school, and I could see a huge chunk of concrete missing from the side of the gymnasium. I coughed, trying to get the acrid taste of smoke out of my lungs. Sit with me, Mallory, Aaron said. He was still lying face up on the hill. I could see now that the hillside was barren. Almost all traces of its lush, green grass were gone. How long had it been since the invasion? Aaron didn't look too great. His clothes were ragged and dirty and his dark hair was matted. It looked like he'd still been shaving every day, but I cringed as I saw red scratches down his face and neck. I took inventory of myself and realized I wasn't in much better condition. My stomach ached. I probably hadn't been eating well. I rifled through false memories. Every day I went to school, and every day I ate in the cafeteria. There must be food in there. I started down the hill, looking over my shoulder, hoping to see no machines lurking around. I glanced back at Aaron. He was staring at the sky again. I raised my eyes. A reddish haze hung in the air. I almost wish I could see the lovely false skies again instead of this harsh reality. Aaron whistled a carefree tune, and I bit my lip, wondering if I should really just leave him there. After all, he'd left me first. I sighed. Come on, Aaron. I grabbed his hand and led him down the hill towards the school. The school hallways were dim and smelled of mold. Aaron and I crept past the abandoned classrooms and the rows upon rows of lockers. While I crept, Aaron walked confidently, without a care in the world. In here, I whispered as we arrived at the cafeteria. The stench was overwhelming. I pushed through the double doors, covering my mouth with the neck of my t-shirt. A swarm of flies hovered around the food bar. Stepping closer, I could see trays full of blackened, slimy food. I wasn't even sure what used to be in those trays. Have I been eating that all this time? Aaron reached out to grab a handful of what might have been peas once. I slapped his hand away. A half-empty rack of potato chips stood in a corner, so I grabbed two bags and gave one to Aaron. That would have to hold us over for now. Noises in the hallway. Footsteps. I plastered myself against the wall, trying to motion for Aaron to duck out of sight. No luck. But the footsteps continued down the hall, and I gathered enough courage to peek through the crack in the door. Three kids, who I recognized as freshmen, strolled past, their footsteps echoing in the empty corridor. They didn't notice me as they happily chattered to one another. One was barefoot, with infected blisters covering her feet. Another's left arm was covered in scorch marks, the singed fabric of his shirt sticking to the burned flesh. The three students turned into an empty classroom, and I took that opportunity to exit the cafeteria, with Aaron in tow. As we passed the gym, I heard more sounds. The door was propped open, 
and inside I saw my old gym teacher, Mrs. Miller. She was holding what looked like a rotten melon, and I watched in fascinated horror as she stood before the basketball hoop, aimed her shot, and threw. The melon splattered against the backboard, sending putrid clumps of fruit and seeds spraying across the room. Mrs. Miller looked to her left, then her right, and clapped enthusiastically. Good pass, Mike, she said to no one in particular. Then she met my eyes. I ducked out of sight and darted toward the exit as I heard her voice echo behind me. You're just in time. We're picking teams. Aaron caught up to me and reached for my hand as I swung the front doors open, stepping out into the red, hazy world. I brushed his hand away. I should ditch him, I thought. But I couldn't bring myself to send this sad, brainwashed ex of mine away. Call me sentimental, if you will. A can clattered to the floor, and I willed myself not to panic. We were in a small grocery store on Lexington, stocking up on supplies. I didn't have much of a plan yet, but I figured we might as well gather enough food to leave the city. There were machines still patrolling the streets. I'd seen three on our way here. Luckily, I'd been able to hide each time, pulling Aaron along with me. I didn't know how long my luck would hold out. I picked up the can and glanced around. No one seemed to notice the clamor, although there were at least five brainwashed people roaming the store. It creeped me out. They walked like they were in a daze, performing their usual tasks as they went about their day, unaware that their world had been flipped upside down. I shuddered to think that I'd been like that too. What made me snap out of it? The floor creaked behind me and I jumped. Spinning around, I saw it was a middle-aged man wandering through the aisles. I took a deep breath and steadied myself, trying to calm my pounding heart. You're free, aren't you? The man said. I looked at him warily. Yeah, I'm talking to you, he said. His voice was clear and steady, low, but not a whisper. You're not brainwashed like the rest of them, are you? Relief flooded through me. I'm not alone. For the first time since I woke up on the hill, my face broke into a smile. Yes! I thought it was just me, I whispered. Must have just snapped out of it, have you? Before I could answer, he continued. You couldn't have lasted this long otherwise. The way you're acting. What do you mean? Sneaking around, jumping at every sound. You stand out like a sore thumb. You need to blend in with the brain cases, or they'll catch you and turn you back into one. Keeps you from fighting back. I nodded. He seemed to know what he was talking about. Are there more of you? A few. Some, like me, have been free since the beginning. They never got to us. Others, like you, snap out of it after a while. How? I'm not even sure what made me come to. To be honest, we're not quite sure. Some think a memory slips through the cracks, one that clashes with the bright, happy world you're trapped in, and some think it's completely random. I thought about that for a minute. I'd been entertaining dreams of finding my friends and family, depending on if I forgave my parents for abandoning me and freeing them from this illusion. I at least had to save Aaron. I couldn't keep dragging him around with me. But if it was random, what chance did I have of saving them? I want to come with you, I said to the man. That should be my first step, finding others like me. Others who could help me. Aaron rounded the corner. He was holding a box of cereal and a beach umbrella. I'm ready, Maul, he said. The man pointed at Aaron. Is that brain case with you? Yeah. No the man said, shaking his head. If you want to come back with me, you have to ditch your friend here. He'll compromise our position. He's not my friend, I said. I sighed and shook my head. But I can't leave him here. The man tugged at his thinning hair. Sorry, kid. Wish I could help. He started making his way to the door. I wanted to run after him, and I looked back and forth from Aaron to the man. Wait, the man turned around at the door. He pursed his lips as if he were making a difficult decision. 
I'll tell you what, he said. Meet me at the clock tower on Oak and Fifth tomorrow. Three o'clock in the afternoon, exactly. No brain cases or no deal. Thank you, I whispered. He gave me an encouraging smile. I believe that you can break people out of the spell. You just have to try hard enough. The door tinkled as the man exited the store. My mind raced. Save Aaron. Meet at the clock tower. Don't. Get. Caught. All right, Aaron, I said with new determination. We have work to do. I heard it before I saw it. The sharp, steady clicking of metal against sidewalk. A machine, a jagged assortment of black metal shapes, advanced toward us on spindly appendages. I fought against the instinct to flee, remembering what the man, the one who'd been free, had told me yesterday. You just need to blend in. The machine was just over a block away. Between us, an older gentleman ambled out of an alleyway. He was holding a leash, dragging something behind him. I gasped when I saw it was the long-dead corpse of a small dog. The man took no notice of the machine, even when it approached him and lingered by his side. I couldn't be sure, but it looked like the machine was inspecting him, watching for any unexpected reaction. The man reached down to pet the decaying dog. My stomach churned as I saw a patch of fur slew right off the corpse and fall to the ground. Good boy, the man said. The machine seemed satisfied and continued on its course towards Aaron and me. Aaron didn't take notice as it hovered around him, but I did. My heart raced and I broke out into a cold sweat. The machine must have decided Aaron was no threat because after a brief look at him, it turned on me next. For a second, I stood completely still. It took me a moment to realize that that was just as suspicious as running, so I willed myself to move forward, one foot after the other. Aaron was strolling ahead, and I matched my footsteps to his. The machine followed. A bead of sweat ran down my face, but I kept my face passive, my eyes straight ahead. Please let this work. Please let this work. Finally, the machine moved on, making its way down the quiet street. Once the sounds of the machine faded away in the distance, I grabbed Aaron's arm. We were close. We crossed the street and I led him around the side of the building, into the shade of a large marquee. A few of the letters had fallen off, but I knew what the sign said. Morning Star Cinemas. There were others like us, the man had said. Others who were free from the illusion brought on by the machines. I could join them, but I couldn't bring Aaron. Not unless he was freed. I thought I could snap him out of it if I could only get him to realize the bright, happy world he saw was a lie. If I could just unlock an unhappy memory, I thought... I could bring the lie crashing down. I had until three o'clock to free Aaron and meet the others at the clock tower. Do you remember this place? I asked. Aaron idly glanced up. Are we going to the movies? Yep, we're going to the movies. It was dark inside the theater, and I was glad I brought a flashlight from the store. The lobby looked eerie the beam of light glancing off the glass sides of the popcorn maker in the back of the room. I made my way down the dark hallway and crept into the nearest theater. Aaron followed. There was a hole in the ceiling. I had no idea if it was caused by the machines or by our own forces, but it let a welcome ray of light into the room. I could see the hazy red sky above. As we entered the theater, I heard a low muttering coming from the seats. Half a dozen people sat in the rows of seats, their vacant expressions trained at the empty screen. A quiet laugh echoed through the room, multiplying as each of the audience joined in. I shuddered at the eerie chorus. That's my favorite part, one person said, and I could only imagine what illusion-induced film was playing in his mind. Aaron and I took a seat in the back of the theater where we'd always sat on our dates. I was thinking of one night in particular, 
So I sat to his right, just the way it'd been. Do you remember when we came here the night before homecoming? Shh, you're missing the previews. I ignored him. The movie we were going to see sold out, so we chose another. I shifted in my seat so I was facing Aaron. He wouldn't meet my eyes, he just stared ahead at the screen with an empty smile on his face. That was the only time I'd seen you cry, I said. It was just a movie, sure. But I know you felt something. Something sad and hurtful. Aaron laughed. <laughs> Watch this part, Mallory, it's great! Aaron, please, you have to remember. I searched for his face for the slightest flicker, a sign that something real made it past the illusion. Just one sad memory, that's all I needed. Aaron chuckled louder, and it rippled through the rest of the audience. I put my hands over my ears. There had to be another way, a worse memory. You must remember this, I said. We were in Aaron's backyard. There was a swing set and a trampoline, though Aaron probably hadn't used them in over a decade. The trampoline was broken, its once taut cloth surface lay tattered on the ground. I wasn't sure if that was from the machine's destruction, or if it had been like that for some time. Aaron stepped inside the trampoline's metal frame and began to jump on the bare dirt below. You fell off the trampoline and broke your arm when you were six, I reminded him. You told me it was the worst pain you'd ever felt. Jump with me, he said. I'm soaring so high. Small plumes of dust rose where his feet hit the ground with dull thuds. I shook my head in frustration. I wasn't getting through. With a glance at my watch, my heart sank. It was almost two in the afternoon. I had an hour to snap Aaron out of it and arrive at the clock tower, or go myself and leave him. Could I bring myself to leave him? It was a wonder any of us had survived so long in this state of childlike wonder. I didn't have faith he'd last much longer. There was one memory I'd been avoiding. Maybe because it was much worse for me than Aaron. For all I knew, it was a happy memory for him. But I was out of time. I had to try. As we neared the familiar street corner, I broke into a run. I stopped when I reached the street lamp, panting for breath. My throat burned and my mind filled with the painful memory of that day. It was raining. Aaron caught up, looking puzzled at my words. Before he could respond, I continued. We were walking home from school, like we always did. We had been fighting again, worse than usual. I thought you'd leave and go home by yourself, but there you were, waiting for me. Aaron yawned. Oh, I'm tired. Can we go home? I grabbed him by the shoulders. You have to remember this. You stopped right here on this corner. It was pouring by then. You told me you didn't want to speak to me anymore, how you couldn't stand to even look at me. It was over, you said. It had been over for a long time. I fought back tears as the terrible memories, the ones I'd blocked myself with no help from the illusion, came rushing back. The fighting, the screaming, the manipulating. Neither one of us had been faithful, but neither one of us deserved it. Aaron had broken up with me, but I pushed him to it. I didn't have the guts to do it myself. You said you hated me, I was shouting now. And then you kissed me! How dare you not remember that? A single raindrop fell from the sky and landed on my cheek. I looked up, just as the skies opened up and water fell from the heavens. Just perfect. But when I looked back, Aaron's face was wet, and not from rain. I cautiously leaned forward, my heart pounding, and kissed him. How dare you not remember that. The sound of machines drawing near. The noise mingled with the sudden onslaught of rain, but I didn't pay any notice. Mallory? Aaron's voice was barely a whisper. What's going on? It worked! He looked so lost, and for a moment, Every awful emotion I had been feeling was wiped clean. 
the clatter of machinery grew louder. I saw Aaron's eyes grow wide, and I realized there was no time to explain, no time to convince him to stay calm and stay free. Wait until you can't see me anymore, and then go to the clock tower. There will be friends there to help you, I whispered in his ear. I'm sorry. I think he said something in return, but I was already running down the street. I blew past the machine and heard a mechanical whir as it picked up speed and followed me. I ran faster than I ever had before and thought, maybe I'll actually get out of this one. That thought vanished as I turned a corner and nearly crashed headfirst into two other machines waiting for me. Can't win them all. The grass felt soft against my back as I lay on the hill behind school. Blue flowers dotted the pristine landscape. Pretty clouds soared overhead and I named their shapes aloud. There was no one to hear me, of course, but why should that stop me? It was another beautiful day. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.